If you've arrived at this video, you're probably seriously considering switching to Linux. Maybe Windows feels restrictive for various reasons. Invasive telemetry, forced updates that restart your PC at the worst possible moments, unexplained slowdowns, or simply the feeling that you no longer have full control of your computer. It's legitimate to seek alternatives, and Linux represents one of these. But be careful, it's not the universal solution for everyone. Today I'll talk honestly about what it really means to migrate to Linux, without propaganda, but also without hiding the real opportunities this system offers. If you follow my channel, you know I don't sell smoke, so let's get straight to the point. What you need to know first. First of all, let's talk about critical hardware. If you have an NVIDIA graphics card, especially on laptops, you absolutely must test your system with a live USB before installing permanently. NVIDIA drivers on Linux have improved over the years, but they can still cause headaches, especially in hybrid Intel plus NVIDIA systems. AMD and Intel cards tend to work better right out of the box. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on very recent hardware may also require some manual intervention to get proprietary drivers working. Then there's the question of professional and niche software. Let's be clear here. 95% of consumer software has valid alternatives on Linux, but about 40 to 50% of specialized professional software doesn't. If you work with AutoCAD, Revit, SolidWorks for CAD and engineering, or with the complete Adobe suite in a professional environment, or with specific business accounting and management software, some medical or vertical software, then Linux is not an option, period. There are no equivalent alternatives, and solutions like Wine or virtual machines for critical software are fragile solutions you can't base your work on. On gaming, however, the situation has changed radically. Until a few years ago, I would have said if you're a gamer, Linux isn't for you. Today, thanks to Proton, which is Valve's technology, Steam Deck, and Lutris, the situation has improved tremendously. Many Windows games work great on Linux, often with comparable performance. But not all games work, especially those with invasive anti-cheat like many competitive multiplayers. Before migrating, check on ProtonDB if your favorite games are supported. If you mainly play competitive online titles, do thorough testing before abandoning Windows. And then there's the plug-and-play user compromise. If you simply want to turn on, turn off, and use your PC without ever touching it, without reading documentation, without learning anything new, then stay on Windows. There's no dishonor in this. Every system has its audience. Linux requires an initial investment of time and curiosity. It's not superior or inferior to Windows. It's different, with a different philosophy. So what's the real point? Linux is the most powerful, versatile, and customizable system available today. But to exploit it, you need to know it, learn it, invest time in it. Without this willingness, you'll go back after 24 hours and never reinstall it again. On Linux, almost everything works, often better than Windows, but it needs to be understood, configured, and refined. You'll find that the screenshot tool doesn't record audio, that some application has a bug, that an update temporarily breaks something. This happens because many Linux desktops are bleeding edge with rapid releases every four to six months, and the user base is smaller, so testing is less thorough. Some distributions are more conservative to minimize these problems, but you'll feel this difference. There isn't just one way to approach Linux. There are three realistic paths. The first is dual boot which is probably the most sensible to start with. You keep Windows for critical software and problematic gaming and use Linux for everything else. It allows you to migrate gradually, test everything calmly, and always have a plan B. It's, it's the most pragmatic and least risky strategy. The advantages are security, gradualness, zero loss of productivity. The disadvantages are that you have to manage two systems and you have to reboot to change operating systems. The second path is using a virtual machine or WSL. You test Linux inside Windows or vice versa without touching the partitions. It's great for learning basic commands, testing software, deciding which distro you like. The advantages are zero risks and it's very easy to try. 
The disadvantages are reduced performance and you don't test real hardware. The third path is complete installation where you completely replace Windows with Linux. It only makes sense if you've verified that all your hardware works, you have alternatives for all your critical software, you have complete backups, and you're mentally ready to face a learning curve. The advantages are the complete experience without compromises. The disadvantages are that it's a point of no return and requires serious preparation. The Linux world is full of people who have tried dozens of distros. It's not a simple and unidirectional ecosystem, but it's very clear if you know what you're looking for. My advice is to start from serious projects with solid communities and established history, not borderline or too niche distributions. If Linux will become your primary system with your data and your digital life, you need reliability. Solid projects are Debian, Fedora, OpenSUSE, Ubuntu, Arch Linux, Linux Mint, Gentoo, Slackware, NixOS, Void, and some others. For those coming from Windows, the most suitable are general purpose and user-friendly distributions. Debian is the universal, stable, historic distribution. It's the basis of half the Linux ecosystem. Conservative, reliable, with a huge software repository. I would choose this one. It's the best compromise for all needs. Linux Mint is based on Ubuntu, which in turn derives from Debian with a Windows-like desktop. It's probably the smoothest possible transition. Fedora is more modern, with bleeding-edge technologies, but well-integrated. It's a good compromise between stability and innovation. OpenSUSE is a more professional and documented choice. Good community, exceptional packaging care, it's a solid choice. To avoid for starting our distributions alternative to the big players. There are many exceptional projects, but they're borderline amateur. Manjaro, for example, has had serious problems like expired TLS certificates on the official site and questionable management. It's not for beginners. Also avoid distributions that are too niche. If you can't easily find documentation and active forums, forget it. If you want to suffer to really learn, there are Gentoo, Arch, Void, and Slackware. They're formative experiences but require enormous time and patience. If you want to have this type of experience, I recommend Slackware. It's the oldest existing distribution, managed by a living legend, stable, pure, ideal for really learning, but obviously difficult, at least initially, for someone coming from Windows. As a second less painful option, I recommend Void Linux. It's the best rolling release distro, a little gem of simplicity, efficiency, and robustness. My practical advice is download two or three ISOs like Debian, Mint, and Fedora, Try them on live USB and choose the one where you feel most at home. The perfect distribution is the one you find comfortable, not the one the internet says. You don't just have to choose your distribution, but also what desktop environment to use. And on Linux, there are dozens. Ours is a free and varied ecosystem. If with Windows and Mac OS you're in a monoculture plantation, Think of using Linux and being in the Amazon rainforest with an infinite quantity of software and projects. Every day one is born, every day one dies. Often someone becomes winning and decisive. Open source is the future, and whether you like it or not, it's determining the technology to come in all fields. The three main desktop environments are excellent, each with a precise philosophy. GNOME offers you a minimalist experience, almost zen obsessed with simplicity and removal of the superfluous. It has a modern workflow based on gestures and workspaces. It's perfect if you appreciate clean design and are willing to adapt to new interaction paradigms. KDE Plasma instead is power, graphic beauty, and infinite customization possibilities. It's the desktop that most closely approaches the concept of do what you want. Rich in functionality, it may seem overwhelming at first, but it allows you to configure every single aspect of the system. XFCE or Mate are more conservative, simple, light. They're probably the closest to Windows in logic and layout. The graphics aren't the most modern, but with the right themes, you can improve them a lot. Perfect if you want stability and simplicity above all else. The truth is that on Linux, you'll rarely find perfect plug-and-play solutions at first try. You'll almost always have to put in a minimum of your own. It's a paradigm shift, from passive user to active user.
I won't give you the usual infinite list. Here's what you really need at the start. The Linux file system works differently, but often it's more the words that intimidate us than the reality of the facts. In short, Linux desktops are completely similar to proprietary counterparts, desktop icons, menus, app stores. Using them in a basic way is child's play. It takes very little. For browsers, I recommend staying with Firefox. It's more integrated, and if you really can't do without Google Chrome or Edge, well, they're installable on Linux too. Use them. Nobody forbids it. But I would take the opportunity to finally try something different, even in browsers. Take a look at Zen Browser. It derives from Firefox and has a beautiful interface. For Office and Productivity, I recommend only Office instead of LibreOffice. Yes, you read that right. Only Office has better compatibility with Microsoft formats, more modern interface, cloud integration. For those coming from Windows, it's less traumatic. Later you'll discover LibreOffice, which is more powerful but requires adaptation. For notes and organization, OneNote isn't there. Joplin is the best alternative. Synchronization between PC, Android, iOS, Markdown support, organization with notebooks and tags. For images, you have GIMP for photo editing, which has a steep learning curve but is powerful, Inkscape for vector graphics, and Krita for digital painting. For multimedia, there's VLC, which you already know and works perfectly. For gaming, obviously, there's Steam, then Lutris for non-Steam games, and Proton Up QT to manage Proton versions. There are some golden rules for installing software. Use your distro's official repositories because they're tested and safe. Don't mix GNOME and KDE applications randomly because you risk installing hundreds of megabytes of useless libraries. Inform yourself before installing, read some reviews, check if it's actively maintained. Avoid adding too many PPAs or external repositories because they can create conflicts and update problems. Don't think your system is secure by default. This isn't the truth. You'll have to inform yourself about how it works and what makes it secure. I made a video about it, and I'll probably make a guide in the future, but for now, as your first time on Linux, don't worry about this initially. Simply be extremely careful about what you install, download, and do, and start informing yourself about CLinux or AppArmor and how to configure them. Do the same with Flatpak and AppImage. They're so-called universal package formats, and it's worth understanding what they are and when to use them. The first mistake is not giving yourself enough time. Time is your best ally. At the beginning, everything will seem hostile and complicated, but it's an impression that fades day by day. Don't get discouraged at the first difficulty. Linux is community. There are very active forums, detailed documentation, thousands of tutorials. Always start from your distribution's official forums with precise and well-formulated questions. Avoid going off topic or you'll ask questions into the void. The second mistake is trying to avoid the terminal. The terminal isn't the enemy. It's the tool that will give you real power. You can use Linux without touching it almost ever, but if you learn even just the basic commands, you'll simplify your life enormously. A well-written command replaces 10 clicks. And above all, the terminal allows you to understand what's happening, diagnose problems, automate repetitive operations. You don't need to become an expert. Nobody knows all the commands. My advice is keep a text file where you note down the commands you use with a brief explanation. Gradually, you'll memorize them. You'll hear about Nano, Vim, Emacs, which are terminal text editors. Inform yourself, try, learn. Linux is continuous learning. The third mistake is thinking that doesn't work means I stopped trying. There's a fundamental difference in philosophy. On Windows, when something doesn't work, you often don't have tools to understand why, so you give up or reinstall. On Linux, when something doesn't work, you have detailed logs, diagnostic commands, forums where to ask, so almost always you can understand and solve. Everything you see on the desktop is in your hands. You can modify it, configure it, correct it. Audio not working? There are commands that show you exactly where the problem is. Detected devices, loaded drivers, Vaudio routing. It's a mentality change from passive user to active user. It's not for everyone, but it's incredibly liberating for those who accept it. The fourth mistake is worrying too much about Photoshop and Office. The world has changed. Instead of seeing Linux as a loss, see it as an opportunity to explore modern alternatives. 
The reality is that Adobe is pushing heavily towards the cloud and subscription prices are high. Microsoft Office has valid alternatives like OnlyOffice, LibreOffice, Google Workspace, Office 365 Web. Many professionals already use workflows completely based on open source tools. Concrete alternatives are for photo editing, GIMP, Darktable, Raw Therapy, for vector graphics, Inkscape, for digital painting, Krita, for video editing, DaVinci Resolve, which has the Linux version available, and KDenLive. For 3D, there's Blender, which is identical on Windows and Linux. The real question isn't, can I do it, but am I willing to learn a new workflow? But be honest with yourself. If you do professional video editing with Premiere and have years of experience, complex projects, specific plugins, Linux might not be the right choice, or at least not in the short term. The fifth mistake is giving yourself unrealistic expectations. The Linux experience isn't identical to Windows. It's not easier. It's not harder. It's different. You have to accept that some tools might not work perfectly at first startup. Some updates might require your intervention. Some configurations require research and study, and occasional bugs happen, especially on rolling release distributions. There are no commercial Linux desktops in the sense of completely pre-configured and automated experience like Windows or Mac OS. There's always a minimum of work to do. If you want maximum stability and comfort, choose XFCE, Mate, or LTS versions, meaning long-term support of Ubuntu or Debian. You weren't expecting a guide on how to install MPV or the infinite list of alternative programs, right? Because that's not the point. The real transition to Linux happens first in your head, in your perception of technology, in the type of relationship you want to have with your computer. You'll find a lot of propaganda about Linux, both positive and negative. The truth is in the middle. Linux isn't better than Windows in absolute terms. It's better for certain uses, worse for others. It's more free, more customizable, more transparent, but it requires more initial effort. The real question you have to ask yourself is, am I willing to invest time to learn? Because Linux is economically free, but it's not free in terms of time. It asks you for curiosity, patience, humility to be a beginner again, willingness to read documentation, acceptance of error and retrying. In return, it gives you total control, absolute transparency, real freedom, deep understanding of how your computer works, and a global community ready to help you. You can be a complete noob, a gamer, a programmer, a creative. There's a Linux distribution for you, from radical minimalism to the most elaborate Baroque. But without the will to learn, you won't go far. So before downloading that ISO and burning that USB stick, ask yourself honestly, am I ready for this? Do I have time to dedicate? Do I really want this type of relationship with technology? If the answer is yes, welcome. The journey will be challenging, sometimes frustrating, but incredibly rewarding. If the answer is no, that's perfectly fine. There's no dishonor in staying where you're comfortable or in trying gradually with dual boot or VM. The important thing is to be honest with yourself. Linux doesn't judge you. The community doesn't judge you. The only person who needs to be convinced is you. Good luck, and remember, Linux is a journey, not a destination.